Hello and welcome to this webcast discussion in the History and Context of Journalism series here at the uh, University of Winchester in the UK. Today's topic is Romanticism and I have with me here in the studio Dr Gary Farnell who gave a lecture earlier today and Dr Farnell uh, is a long-standing member of the British Association for Romantic Studies uh, and a lecturer here at the University of Winchester. Also joining me in the studio are Ali al um uh, George Berridge and Felicity Houston who are students, first year students here at the University of Winchester and they have some questions to ask. So without further ado, I'm going to start off by asking Ali, one of our students here, um, if he has any questions uh, for uh, Gary. In the 1970s, when asked what the effects of the French Revolution were, the first Chinese Premier famously said, it's too soon to tell. I'm wondering, does this answer still ring true today? I'm sure if one was to put this question directly to members of the French population, uh, this Chinese perspective on, is the French Revolution over or not? Uh, the vast majority of them would want to affirm that it's a, a living entity. Uh, that in that uh, very precise sense, the French Revolution of 1789, even though it's over 200 years old, is not over. Uh, the historical record shows that we're into the third instalment of the French Republic. Uh, the history of the French nation is interrupted in terms of alternating between monarchical and republican forms and the very fact that fr France today continues to be a republic uh, underlines for us how so many of the, the, the core ideas of 1789 uh, are still live issues for the French people. But the connection there between the French Revolution and Romanticism which we think of primarily I think as a movement in the arts um, is the centrality of that event, the French Revolution, on the imagination, the collective imagination of the artistic community of Europe, I suppose, but although you, you, you were talking mainly about British artists. Yes. Uh, this time we might have a quotation from one of the Romantics themselves as opposed to a Chinese uh, commentator, and probably the, the ideal quotation uh, remark to reach for is that one by Percy Shelley. Uh, writing a letter to Lord Byron in 1816 where he makes that oft-quoted uh, suggestion that the French Revolution is the master theme of the epoch in which we live. Uh, and perhaps the most interesting thing about this remark is that it's made in 1816, some 20 years or so, uh, after the late 1780s, uh, and refers back to as I mentioned in my lecture, uh, a moment when Percy Shelley himself was not living in 1789. Uh, therefore, he registers this uh, currency of the French Revolution uh, in a very immediate way uh, in his correspondence with Lord Byron. Since Ali's put this on the table, the, the political side of uh, uh, Romanticism, I mean, there's a philosophical side and an artistic side, which I hope we're going to be able to discuss, but... You uh, were referring to the poem Ozymandias um, and the Prometheus cult generally. Can you explore that a bit further for us, uh, the connection between this ancient uh, and rather weird myth of Prometheus with uh, the politics of the 19th century? How does that work? Yes, I hope in my lecture I didn't uh, overdo it, but I <clears throat> fashioned this phrase that Prometheus is a god of romanticism. And I think that's perhaps not too uh, grandiose a description in that it's something that we can reach for that gives us a certain leverage in terms of understanding the romantic movement as a whole. Prometheus is a symbolic figure who condenses for us uh, a variety of messages. Prometheus is the bringer of fire, the figure who is punished by his tyrannical ruler, Jupiter, the ruler of all the gods, uh, for stealing fire in order to be able to give to humankind, help humankind improve itself. Prometheus is punished for 30,000 years by being chained to Mount Caucasus, Mount Caucasus uh, and has a vulture gnawing at his liver for those 30,000 years. So that there's that more commonplace notion of 
Prometheus being a champion of the underdog, uh, which has a very strong resonance in relation to the romantic imagination. Thanks, that's, that's uh, interesting. Uh, Ali, do you want to pick up on, it, on any of that? Uh, there's one thing that I noticed in the lecture, which is when you put up the picture of Ozymandias, I, I'm not sure who uh, that painting was by, but um, I noticed that although he was being pecked at by that vulture, he was he seemed very sort of royal and gallant in a way, mm. and there was that it, it was all gold and he's looking towards the sunset or, or sunrise or towards the distance away from the vulture yes. and it seems more like he is in control then. I think you mean, you mean Prometheus, the yes, picture of Prometheus. Prometheus, yeah. Yes. Uh, did I say Ozymandias? Yes, but just a slip of the tongue, um, don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, uh, Prometheus, he seemed more, more sort of regal in, in his... Uh, but that's a fascinating well, question. I mean, who, who was Catherine. Prometheus? And yes. what is the significance of this noble yes. bearing? Yes. <coughs> the, 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 the painting we were looking at was by Gustave Moreau, a, a 19th century French romantic painter. He's part of this cult of Prometheus. Uh, and Prometheus is a figure from classical mythology. And what wasn't mentioned earlier, that the meaning of his name maybe I should have mentioned this, Prometheus means foresight. And in a way, I think Ali has registered this in terms of how he sees Prometheus's facial demeanor, that kind of high, noble forehead. He's very much you know, gazing forward, looking into the future, even though behind him he's chained to the rock and down to his side he's got the vulture pecking at his vitals. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's deliberate on Moreau's Heart, as the painter, the creator of that image, that he wants to convey that sense of nobility uh, and to suggest that, that core notion of an, identic an identification between Prometheus and this notion of foresight. He's a hero of foresight and this is what makes him a, a, a leader-like figure to those to whom he gives inspiration. And his nobility is perhaps derived from his, his willingness to take on the gods that cause themselves, fate itself, to not submit to fate, to, uh, you know, he's an incredibly noble and brave mm. sort of metaphorical figure. Any particular real historical figures from that period that, that would, be, would have been seen as being like Prometheus? It, it, it's ambiguous. I mean, the, the, the big hero of the day, the single most famous person on the planet, into the early uh, 19th century of the Romantic Age uh, is Napoleon Bonaparte, which sort of connects with where we came in about the history of the French Revolution. And um, among others, Lord Byron is one of the writers of the day who is forging that connection between Prometheus. We had reference to Lord Byron's poem of that name earlier, 1816. Also in 1816, he's writing about uh, Napoleon as a fallen figure in the third canto of his um, extended poem, um, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. And just as in Child Harold's Pilgrimage, Napoleon is ambiguously um, a hero but also a, a fallen icon. So there are elements in the way that Lord Byron speaks of Prometheus in his counterpart poem where Prometheus is not only a, a hero but a heroic overreacher so that what slightly qualifies this notion of a hero of great foresight he can also be someone who is capable of bringing about his own downfall whether it's Prometheus in terms of classical mythology or Napoleon post the Battle of Waterloo 1815 in terms of historical reality. Can I bring in George now because I think George wants to explore some of these themes as well. Um, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question more to, uh, more to the point of the political side of how romanticism, and especially I think it's quite relevant today with everything that's going on in the Middle East, 
uh, we referred to the idea that came across in the lecture that romanticism and everything of that era, the philosophy of the time, implies that uh, the way that people should live is under a democracy. And I want to ask the question of why not base, uh, Chris pointed out earlier, the idea of genius, of especially uh, to use the example of the romantic genius of Beethoven, uh, why not simply put him as kind of an overlord rather than use it as a democracy? So the genius factor, which comes up again later with Nietzsche and so on, another, we want to get into that now, but uh, the idea that there are super people who, who, who perhaps have a higher level of artistic sensibility. They can see things that ordinary people can't, and therefore, why shouldn't we be led by, by them? Mm. 